Pray soon peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're continuing with our look at the Ten Commandments, the first chief part. And today we're going to be talking, or in this video, we're going to be talking about uh, the third, three uses of the law. But before we get to the three uses of the law, I, I have to I have to clarify uh, how the Bible uses law and gospel is different than what I'm going to be talking about when I talk about the three uses of the law and the doctrine of the proper distinction between law and gospel. Okay, uh, so bear with me here. I found this very confusing because I learned the doctrines before I read the Bible. And so I learned the doctrines and then the Bible would be talking about law and gospel. And I thought it was talking about the same law as in the three uses of the law and the doctrine of law and gospel. And the vast majority of the time that the word law is used is not referring to God's commands, you know, the, God's rules or precepts. Uh, it, it generally is in the broader category of God's revelation or the Torah, what in theology we call the broad use of the law. The narrow use, which we're going to be talking about, are God's commands, rules, precepts. Uh, we'll talk about this with the, the gospel I'll talk about later. So the three uses of law, God's law uh, or God's commands, this is going to extend to human commands, human culture as well. Uh, hopefully those will line up with God's commands. That being said, here are the three uses of the law and why it's so important that we distinguish between these three uses of the law. So we've got curb, mirror, and rule. And rule always, always confused me, but let's, let's go over them. Uh, the first use of the law, the curb, is the civil use of the law. Uh, what God's commands are used for by society, by civilization, you know, when we have civilization, when we bring people together, we have to have laws or rules for behavior. Primarily, the vast majority of these rules are not legislation. They're not government-imposed rules. The vast majority of the order and rules we have are simply societal. Uh, you can tell this because you'll have one place where, you know, you say, when was the last murder? And you kind of scratch your head and you go, huh. It's been, uh, well, unfortunately, it hasn't been that long here. Uh, whereas if we were in, say, Chicago, we'd go, when was the last mur? Oh. And seven minutes later, you go, there's another one. Uh, the difference isn't in the legislation. The difference is in their curb has broken down. The curb, the restraint on rampant sin. And it's important to emphasize rampant sin. Uh, as soon as we start trying to legislate and impro uh, you know, go beyond the rampant sin, you know, the raping, the pillaging, the murdering, uh, once we go beyond that, we start becoming tyrants and having a police state. So different societies, of course, will have different extremes on, you know, how much behavior we're talking about. Uh, the reason I make this distinction is just because God says it doesn't mean we should have legislation or a societal rule here. Uh, what we live by as Christians is a much higher standard. It's the standard of love. The first use of the law is just to say, okay, humans start to act like animals, and we just want a restraint so we can have the uh, veneer of civilization on these people, okay? Uh, because we quickly, very quickly get out of control, uh, as we've seen in various societies and various places. So here's how this works. On the societal level, you have the fear of punishment and promise of reward. You know, you do the right thing, you're given praise. You do the wrong thing, you're shunned or excluded or punished in some way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, it's the, the whip, it's behavior modification, you put up a curb, you put up a wall that makes it hard to do these rampant, wicked, awful things. Uh, this is based on natural law, if you've heard that term. Uh, it's where conscience comes into play. We know what's good and bad somewhat from, uh, from, from God and from society. Uh, this can also be used on a personal level, as in you realize, 
oh, wow, this behavior is really destructive. I need to stop doing it. You can use fear of punishment, promise of reward. You can put up your own curbs. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I, I want to stop uh, drinking or using drugs. Maybe I should stop hanging out with people where they're using drugs and alcohol. You know, I want to stop gossiping. So maybe I should stop hanging out with people who gossip and just revel in that. You put up curbs and barriers to it on a personal point of view. Uh, Jesus talked about this when he says, you know, pluck out your eye, cut off your hand, you know, eliminate the temptation, in other words. Uh, so those are two ways, societally and then on a personal level as well. The biggest confusion with this with this use of the law, it has to do with righteousness. And here we want to distinguish between righteousness with God and righteousness with other people. You know, righteousness before God, righteousness before other people. We so easily get those two confused and we go, I'm a good person. You ask 90 whatever percent of people, you know, are you a good person? And they'll go, yeah, I'm a good person. Doesn't matter if they're a rapist, a murderer, doesn't matter how bad they are, doesn't matter how good they are, they're not a good person. I'm sorry, they think they're a good person. Uh, the only people, the only people who say that they're bad people are people who are, you know, tend to be the best people. You know, the better they are, the more likely they're to recognize that they're not good people uh, because they're more aware of their sin. The better you are, the more aware of your sin you are. Uh, so this confusing of civil righteousness with God's righteousness, because we human beings think God grades on a curve. And the problem being is that our curve is so skewed toward evil, toward badness, that we end up getting confused and thinking, oh, look at where I am on this curve. It's like, yeah, but look at how far to the left your curve is. You missed God's righteousness not by a mile, but by the difference between heaven and earth. So that's to me the, the biggest reason we need to be concerned about the first use of the law is because you'll run into people who are, compared to other human beings, good people, to which I go, thank God there are decent people. They're decent, but they're not genuinely good. We come to the second use of the law, and by the way, uh, Calvin numbered these three uses differently. And then there are people who, uh, Lutherans apparently, who think there's no third use of the law. So I'm gonna give the numbering, the Lutheran numbering, the Lutheran way, all three uses. The mirror of God's law uh, or the hammer of God's law, that's from Jeremiah 23. Uh, it shows us our sin. It shows us how we truly are. It's like a hammer, it's going to beat us up and recognize how far short we fall of the glory of God. This is the theological use of God's commands, God's law. God's law shows us our rebellious condition. When we truly hold up the mirror of God's law to our faces and we go, oh, you shall not murder? Pat myself on the back because I've never killed anybody. All right, yay me. And then you start going, oh, that protects the gift of life. Have I truly treated people's lives with dignity and respect? Have I treasured people? Have I cared for the poor, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, the vulnerable people, those who are outcast, those who are disenfranchised? Have I shown that I value their life? And all of a sudden you go, whoa, um, I don't just fall short. I fall way short. And so what we do is we take the mirror of God's law and we start using it, it like the first use of the law, and we start comparing ourselves to other people. And I go, well, I'm better than that person because, wow, you know, I've never killed anybody, but that person did. And, you know, I'm faithfully married to my wife, but, you know, those people, oh, man, their sexual immorality is just so bad. And, you know, abortion and, you know, homosexuality and all those bad things that people do and uh you know they rape and pillage and murder or whatever they do and we we twist the mirror and we no longer see ourselves and we use it to condemn others rather than to condemn ourselves because the law always accuses and for those of you who like latin that's lex semper accusat 
the law always accuses. The question is, which way are you pointing the mirror? Because it's supposed to condemn you. All right, third use of the law. Once you've been saved by grace, once the Holy Spirit dwells within you, uh, once you're operating by the power of the Holy Spirit, working through his word, and you're going, well, I want to do good, but what's good? What's bad? And so we go to God's commands, and now we're asking, uh, you know, not how do we order society, not, you know, how do I reveal my sin to myself, but I simply go, wow, you know, what, what should I do with my wife? You know, do I, do I beat her up or do I give her a hug? And I go to God's word and it, it tells me I should love my wife and I should treat her, uh, sacrifice myself for her and treat her the same way I would treat myself. And it's like, oh, okay. That's how I'm going to start treating my wife because of what Jesus did for me, because I want to do what's right. That being said, the law always accuses. I will always fall short of God's glory. I will always fall short of God's commands. Uh, so I tend to think of this as, you know, like a rule or a lamp or like glasses where I now have clarity to see uh, what's good and bad. But this is important. The law gives no power to obey it. And this is a huge mistake made within Christianity is that Christians assume that when the Bible tells you to do something, that you can do it by your own reason, by your own strength, okay? Uh, so when it tells you to, you know, seek God or, you know, do something, they assume, oh, you can do this as if you're a free agent. And we go, you're not a free agent. You do not have free will. That's going to get me in trouble. Your will is bound by sin, uh, you're, you're bound by the devil, the world, and your sinful flesh uh, to sin. You know, you have all the free will in the world to sin in this way or in that way or in some other way, uh, but you don't have the freedom not to sin until the Holy Spirit sets you free, until the Holy Spirit sets your will and your heart and your mind aright. All right? Uh, so hopefully that explains the three uses of the law. It's important to distinguish between these three uh, because we, when we start confusing them, we start inserting ourselves in a place that only Jesus belongs. All right, you're, you're with me. Uh, any questions, comments, I would love to hear them. Uh, this isn't so much about Bible passages, the three uses of the law, but simply how we actually use God's commands in our everyday life. I, I think. Not sure about that. I'll have to think about that. All right. God's peace be with you. Amen.